So at this point, we've gone over essentially a set of core techniques that I think can become a regular part of your toolbox. And for the most part, we've devoted um, lectures to various techniques and had problems that reinforce those techniques. What I want to do in the last couple of lectures, in the last couple of classes, is talk about a few additional techniques that either over the years I've found to be useful or I've read about and thought this could be useful to us. Um, where as specialized tools for a particular aspect of your research, I think they could be valuable. And so what I'm going to do today and on Friday is talk about some other useful NMR techniques that we're probably not going to encounter. And the only one I'm going to hedge on is the first that James is gearing up to give us a spectrum on for strychnine and possibly to include on the problems, not to on the exam problems, not to make your lives harder, but on the contrary, to make your lives easier by a technique that I think uh, might be useful, but it's the first year we've we've used it. And so there are two techniques that I'm going to, to start with here. Um, one of them is uh, 2D J resolved uh, spectroscopy. It's one of the simplest 2D NMR spectroscopy techniques, I'll say 2DJ resolved H1 NMR. And the other is E cozy, which means uh, exclusive cozy. And both of these provide information uh, on coupling, and I guess I could say, uh, maybe I'll say easier access to coupling information. And I'm going to be giving examples from some books here. And I wanted to show these books to you because I think these are worth having either on your bookshelf if you're going to be using a lot of NMR or at least knowing, knowing where you can, can find them. So I'm going to start by sharing, sharing handout number, number one here and talking a little bit about that. So when this book first came out in the very first edition, it was titled 100 or more and more NMR experiments, a practical course. And what the authors of this, this book did, I think they're in Germany, what the authors of this book did was basically just have a couple of pages for each NMR experiment. They didn't focus on interpretation, so they weren't focusing on using the technique to solve a problem, but they essentially showed how to implement it. Now, we haven't talked a lot about sort of detail, experimental details, in part because the NMR facility makes things pretty turnkey. There are some parameters I've mentioned repeatedly, for example, the number of increments in the F1 dimension, the TD parameter which if you collect more increments, give you better resolution. I've talked about this when we're talking about heteronuclear experiments like HMQC, HMBC, and HSQC toxi, where if you've got carbon resonances that are within a few tenths of a PPM, uh, increasing digital resolution in the F1 dimension can be very helpful. But other than that, and I've mentioned, okay, there's a delay that's used in the HMBC where you can go ahead and vary the time of this delay. If it's short, you only get bigger coupling constants. If you make it longer, it can pick up some of the smaller J2 and J3 CHs, but 
there's not that much flexibility on that. So we haven't emphasized it. I mentioned the mixing time, which is absolutely critical in the TOXI and HSQC TOXI and even ROSI experiments. And we talked a little bit about that and we've seen the implication. This uh, particular book goes into all the delays that, that are involved in these experiments and helps implement them. So if you ever end up wanting, uh, wanting to implement them, it's the sort of thing that if you worked with Phil, uh, a section from this book would be very useful. So when the book came out initially, it was 100 more NMR experiments. And then a few years later, they came out with a second edition, which was 150 and more NMR experiments. And then a few years later, they came out with 200 and more NMR experiments. And I dutifully bought each book because they're very, very good books. Here's an example of of a way in which they present it. They talk about the pulse sequence, they give some, some details, and then they, sit and they, they show you the various parameters that typically get used, how to process the spectra. And then other than a few comments, they basically provide an example of a spectrum. And we'll start with the 2DJ result. So, after that book, they came out with yet another book. Who wants to guess what the next book they came out with after the 200 and more NMR experiments was? 250 and more. And that's what I would have expected. And they came out with this book, which I bought, bought as well. And this one is really great. What they did was say, okay, we're not just going to get you lost in the alphabet soup of NMR techniques. We're going to select techniques that are really useful to people and go into a little more detail. And they're still not going into the type of detail on interpretation, but they actually write a little bit and they curate among this them. And that's, of course, what I've done in this course is to curate techniques and say, look, I know there's a lot of variants of experiments. Let's take the ones that we're going to want in our toolbox. So I wanted to take a moment to talk about some of the experiments, because if you were to buy one book, I would recommend this book if you wanted to buy, if NMR is, is a big part of your research, I would recommend this book. Each of the chapters is now a little longer. They expand on things a little bit. They talk about context. They still provide references, but it's, it's curated, so it's nice. So one of the techniques I know at least tangentially we've seen at one point is this other variant that's similar to DEPT. So APT is similar to DEPT. Um, it stands for Attached Proton Test. It's a little simpler to implement than depth. Uh, there's probably not a good reason you'd need it, um, but it, it only provides one spectrum and your C, your quats and your CH2s are up and your CHs and CH3s are down. And honestly, if I had only done this experiment instead of depth, I think you would have always been able to spot your quats in the 1D spectrum so you'd know where they were. This would tell you your CH2s. You'd spot your methyls from any uh, HSQC or HMQC experiment, and you'd know your CHs. So it's a fine experiment. What, what depth brings and why depth is a good technique is the PT that stands for polarization transfer. It's a little bit trickier technique to implement. One of the reasons why James and I are constantly putting little X's to help you distinguish artifacts in the experiment from it being implemented imperfectly. But what's nice it, is it requires fewer scans 
then C third, then a regular C13 NMR for each subspectrum, because what you're doing is you're getting the higher, you're taking advantage of the large uh, Boltzmann, relatively large, still very small, Boltzmann distribution from the protons and you're transferring that to the carbon. So you're swapping. So that can be a useful, useful technique. Um, another technique that I will point out to you is a very specialized tool is a heteronuclear overhauser effect spectroscopy. And I guess I'll give you a hypothetical example. So we've done NOEs from proton to proton. And usually that's the most useful technique. We've used it in many, many problems for determining stereochemistry and conformational analysis. But imagine the following. Imagine I had an let's just say an ethyl ester and let's just say to keep this simple, a methyl ester on let's say a cyclopropane ring. And let's say I had a methyl group on the cyclopropane ring. And I want to figure out which side the methyl group is cis to. We probably won't be able to get an NOE to the ethyl group or the methyl group on the esters. They're too far away. But we're probably going to be able to, uh, but the methyl group is going to be close to one of the carbons. And so what we can do is use a heteronuclear overhauser effect experiment to look for an NOE to the carbon. It's a pain in the neck of an experiment, but you could look at it and say, which carbonyl gives you an NOE with the methyl group? And that would allow you to determine whether the methyl group was cis to the ethyl ester or cis to the methyl ester. So that's the sort of case where you might want this experiment. And there, there are both 2D and 1D var uh, variants of it. Um, but that's one that I think is worth having in your toolbox. We've talked, does anyone have questions about, about that technique? All right, we've talked a little bit about heteronuclear NMR, and we've had at least one example of a fluorine NMR and perhaps one example of a silicon NMR. For those people who are working with metals and metal complexes, some metals end up having very good NMR spectra. So for example, platinum 195, NMR is just great. So you can imagine if your, your research involves certain metals like platinum and you're interested in things like phosphine ligands on it, you could imagine being able to look at splitting, you could look at the geometry, you could look at symmetry in the complex. That's very useful. In my own lab, and I know we've seen at least one example of fluorine NMR and the homework setter. I guess we had two, two examples. In my own lab, uh, my Krumberger is doing a lot of work with a compound that contains a trifluoromethyl group. And so it's actually a trifluoromethyl, well, carbonyl among other things, carbonyl and diazerine and so forth. And in his synthetic chemistry, it's really, really nice to be able to go ahead and use the F19 NMR, and it ends up almost being like an HPLC spectrum. 
where he can see his starting material, he can see his product, he can see byproducts or side products. And once he learned which peak was which, he could use F19 NMR very nicely to monitor the course of the reaction. It works just great. Others in my lab are doing chemistry with phosphenes. And although it's not listed here, P31 NMR, which again, I think we've seen or talked about is another very good, very simple NMR technique. All of these, well, many of these nuclei here have nuclear dipoles. N15 has a nuclear dipole. Fluorine 19 has a nuclear dipole. Phosphorus 195 has a nuclear dipole. These are all relatively straightforward techniques to implement uh, where they don't require any, uh, any sort of specialized techniques. Some of them like boron 11 NMR, I think are a little bit a little bit trickier to implement. But anyway, I recommend it highly. The 400 megahertz NMR spectrometer is easily set up for phosphorus. And uh, actually now I think we're doing that on the 600. Anyway, these are not hard techniques to implement and I do recommend them highly. Let's see, in the case of proteins, Really one of the working experiments that we end up doing, I won't say all the time, but do routinely, is a hydrogen, nitrogen, HSQC, or uh, N15, H1, uh, HSQC. And it basically generates a fingerprint for a protein. You can express a protein with N15 at every position. And what the proton hydrogen HSQC does is you generate N15 is on the F1 axis, H1 is on the uh, F2 axis. And so it looks very much like a regular carbon Remember, HSQC and HMQC are essentially the same technique. They differ slightly in the implementation. So what you get is basically a cross peak for every NH in the molecule, like so. And so you will pick up virtually all your NHs. And then what you can do is if you have some type of interaction of the protein, for example, binding to a ligand, certain of these spots are going to, upon binding to a ligand or other things, may end up shifting in position. So some of them will be on top of where they were before, and others of them may... Um, may shift and you'll be able to pick up and basically say, okay, this part of the protein is interacting or you'll be able to even just match up a fingerprint or maybe you're expressing a mutant protein and you wanna know if it folds like the wild type protein. If you express it with N15, then you can just see if the fingerprints largely match up and that would be a good indication of folding. So usually what you do is you express the protein with N15 ammonium chloride, which is not too expensive, in the nutrient media and the bacteria just produce the protein with that. Now there's a whole area, and this is not a hard experiment to implement. There's a whole area of NMR that involves 3D NMR spectroscopy 3D, again, doesn't mean that the spectrum is three-dimensional. It means that you have now a time, a time one dimension, a time two dimension, a time three dimension that translates to frequencies. Usually this is used uh, for proteins, sometimes for nucleic acids. It's a mainstay of biomolecular NMR a little bit more expensive 
uh, you can express your protein with N15 and C13 in it. So now you have three spin active nuclei in the protein and you can get correlations for every resonance with the carbons and protons and N15s. And then you can use this to figure out uh, the three dimensional structure of the protein. Sorry about that. I should be silencing my cell phone here. So anyway, I think that's what I wanted to say about, about this technique. Um, and I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment at this point and take any questions that people might have before moving on to some of the other techniques. Um, I thought of one right after uh, you moved forward regarding that uh, ethyl and methyl ester of the cyclopropane. Uh -huh. um, how is there any other way that you might distinguish what side of the ring that methyl's on? That's gonna ooh. So you're asking a good a good question, Brian. So I guess the, the molecule that I had hypothetically set up was, let's say, a methyl group. And we had either it being cis to an ethyl ester or being cis to a methyl ester, just to put a concrete uh, spin on things. That's a very good question. So from J values, certainly I could assign, and you'll notice I've mentioned again and again the appendix F as, as uh, in Silverstein as well as the Pretch book. From J values, we could assign which proton, which proton is cis to this hydrogen and which proton is trans to the hydrogen. So we could assign these diastereotopic protons. Uh, from homonuclear NOEs, we could assign, you know, we could also assign whether the meth methyl group is cis or trans to these protons. The problem is here, my guess is that the methyl group and the methylene of the ethyl group are probably too far. So you could try, certainly the first thing I would try in this hypothetical problem is for a homonuclear NOE, just to see if I would get an NOE from the methyl to this methyl or this CH2 group. But I wouldn't bet a lot of money on it because they're pretty far away. And remember for 1D NOE, generally we're talking about 2.5 angstroms being, being kind of strong, you know, by 3.5, it's probably weaker and we're probably over four, and that's gonna be probably very weak or not seen. So I wouldn't bet a lot of money on it. Now the distance from this hydrogen over to this carbon is just going to be probably two, two-ish angstroms, two, two and a half angstroms. So that should give a nice strong NOE. The experiment's a pain to implement. I can't think, I can't think of another experiment. You might be able to do something by chemical shift prediction. And remember I mentioned early on, I said there's added empirical additivity for shift prediction. That won't help you. You know, those are the tables we've used and, and your chem draw calculations. That's not gonna help you. But I mentioned that there's a more sophisticated approach involving electronic structure calculations and that that approach is, uh, has, would have potential. So yes, so what Professor Rychnowski did in his paper where I show you the nice, uh, the nice calculated uh, structure on the fake natural product, the nice calculated spectrum on that, um, 
you might be able to get away with that, but I suspect again that NOE would be the definitive experiment and that it would have to be a heteronuclear NOE. Good question, Brian. Other questions? All right, I want to move on to, uh, to 2DJ Resolved and eCOSI. So I'm going to share my screen again and go back to handout number one. All right, so, so this is an example of a 2DJ Resolve spectrum. On your x-axis, you get the H1 NMR spectrum. And your y-axis, uh, x-axis, the, the, uh, the, the F1 axis, and on your F2 axis, you get your J's, your coupling constants. And I want to show you how to read this. As I said, we're going to try to help you out uh, with some of your spectra. So basically, under each peak, you get a set of cross peaks. And I want to show you what we're looking at. This particular example is a nice first order experiment, first order example of ethyl crotonate. So ethyl crotonate has the two alkene protons. One of them is directly next to the methyl. One's allylic. And so you can see the one that's directly next to the methyl. And you can see the one that's allylic. And this one, you would expect it to be split by the trans J value, so big coupling, and then by the methyl group with the vicinal coupling. So this is a DQ. And then the, the hydrogen that's allylic to the methyl, you'd expect it to be split by a big J value for the trans hydrogen-hydrogen uh, coupling, but also a long range allylic coupling. So you'd expect it to be a DQ. And I just want you to, to take a look at how the peaks appear. And so if you look here, we see peak, 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 peak. And those peaks, if you were to do a projection, are one to three to three to one in intensity. And so basically you're getting this doublet of quartets spread out along the uh, J axis, along the F2 axis. And that's nice because you can pick it out. It's also helping to resolve out the peaks. Here you see the quartet, the same thing you've got your peaks and you can very nicely pick out your, your J values for say the CH2, which you have over here. Now, the reason I haven't been a bigger advocate of this is it's good for overlapping first order peaks. And I wanna emphasize that. Now, the problem is, and I'll say maybe instead of peaks, I'll write, write multiplets just to make it very clear. And we know that problem. The problem is this is good when the resonances are well-defined. So overlap of resonances where it's not first order, where it's a mess, which are the ones we've just spent a lot of time looking at on the latest homework set, that's not going to help you because those resonances are not first order multiplets. So these are the ones where you have them in the same spin system often. That's not going to resolve it. It's not going to solve the problem. So I'll say it won't be magically simplified. 
So the examples that we looked at, particularly problems four and problems five on the homework where I said HSQC Toxi is really going to help us out here. That's not going to, uh, those examples where we just, you know, got hopelessly lost trying to walk our way through the cozy spectrum because it was such a bloody mess and the multiplets were non-first order, those won't magically resolve. So we'll try doing this for strychnine and we'll see if we can go ahead and have something helpful for you and get that to you. As I said, it's not particularly hard to interpret. I mean, here, I guess the hardest thing on this triplet is recognizing, okay, these are three lines. These are just little nothings at the baseline. So basically saying, okay, I can pick this out for this triplet, or here we have a doublet of doublets for that allylic methyl group in the molecule. Any questions or thoughts on this technique? All right, I want to move on to another technique. And I believe this one is, let's see, I think this is also, yeah, this is also from this, this 200 more uh, NMR techniques booklet. So eCOSI, as I said, stands for exclusive COSI. And what it does is it gives you the J values. You can see them directly in the cross peak. So let me show you the technique. I'm going to flip ahead. And I think this is ah, not the last page of the handout. I'll show XE next time. So I've never run this technique myself. And when I read about this, I said, this looks useful. And I know I've seen it used. The example in the book was particularly vexing because I couldn't understand the spectrum. I couldn't uh, place the spectrum. So they took a relatively simple compound. They took dibromopropanoic acid here. And I was trying to read the spectrum and finally I realized what they had done. They had zoomed in on a region of the cozy spectrum. So basically this is the diagonal over here, so you could imagine that the spectrum is sort of like, like this over here, and they just, oops, they just zoomed in on a little region making it very hard to understand. That was the first thing that I thought was, was a little hard to understand in just reading the book. Then the second was, what are you actually extracting from here? So let's just talk about the molecule. The molecule has a hydrogen on carbon two, and then it has two, so we have a stereocenter here. And then on carbon three, we have two diastereotopic hydrogens, so they don't show up together. So this is just what you would get if you added bromine uh, across acrylic acid. So if you treated acrylic acid, if you treated propenoic acid with molecular bromine. So then I ended up looking at this, trying to see, okay, how do you interpret these spectra? And what you're getting here are cross peaks that are reflective of the coupling. So this cross peak here, for example, reflects the coupling of H2 with H 3a. And what we see are this series of two squares that come out to the coupling constant. And if you look at the distance, you notice we have squares here. One, two, three, four, and then one, two, three, four. And all of these distances are the same. And these distances here, if you measure that distance in Hertz, that is your J between the two and three A protons. So that 
that is your J value. You can read it directly off the cross peak. That's kind of nice. And we have the same thing going on here. So this is the cross peak that corresponds to two with three B. So this distance here is J uh, is, whoops, J four, two with three B. And this last one here is three A with three B. And again, this distance is the J of the geminal coupling of the 3A to 3B. That's kind of nice to be able to extract that out of a single cozy. So I'll just write as a note here, distance Distance between dots and squares is the J value. All right. Any questions on this technique? All right, I think what I want to talk about right now are chiral shift reagents. This is a this is a technique that doesn't get a lot of use these days. So I'm gonna group it into how to tell an antiomeric purity by NMR spectroscopy. And one of the points I've made repeatedly in this course is that enantiomers inherently show up in the exact same position. If I have one enantiomer, the other enantiomer, or the racemate, all three of those will have the same NMR spectrum. If I have L-phenylalanine, D-phenylalanine, or racemic phenylalanine, all three of those molecules will have identical NMR spectra. You can't tell chirality without something chiral by NMR. And in order to introduce uh, this, so I guess, as I said, I'm gonna talk one about chiral shift reagents. And then second, I'll talk about chiral derivatizing agents. And in order to understand chiral shift reagents, we have to understand a very old tool that was developed a long time ago when NMR magnets were much weaker called lanthanide induced shift reagents. So what lanthanide induced shift reagents are, are complexes of the lanthanum metals. All of the lanthanum metals are paramagnetic. So for example, europium is paramagnetic and they all like to coordinate lots of Lewis basic groups. So what people did was they developed shift reagents, usually with europium or in some cases, praseodymium, where you have three ligands on the metal and those ligands are ACAC type ligands. 
So an ACAC ligand is acetyl acetonate, and acetyl acetonate is acidic, and you can form an anion, and that anion has two oxygens, and so it's great for coordinating to a metal. And in the case of the lanthanides, you can fit basically as much stuff around the metal as you can squeeze around it. And in the case of the lanthanides, that means you can fit three ACAC ligands on very nicely. Now that still leaves an open, that still leaves open coordination sites that can co coordinate to additional Lewis bases. So one of the reagents, one of the ACAC ligands that's used is DPM. And again, I guess I'll just draw now the, the ligand. And I'm, remember all of these ACAC, this is acetyl acetone. And the protons in the center are acidic. So all of these ligands are derived essentially from ACAC. So one version that has two T-butyl groups, a, a pivot wheel group, two pivot wheel groups, is a DPM ligand. It's called DPM, dipivot wheel methane. And so the reagent here is EUDPM3. And then another reagent that gets used is one that has a hexafluoropropyl group on it. And again, I guess I'll just draw it as the, the ligand. In other words, not indicating specific bonds. And this one's called FOD. And so the reagent that's often used is EUFOD3. So that's, that's the gist of these reagents. And let me show you how they work. So if I cartoon the reagent out like this, you have an open coordination site at the top or at the bottom. And a Lewis basic group like an alcohol can coordinate on and what happens is the paramagnetic effect from the europium, so basically the oxygen ends up as a ligand, and the paramagnetic effect changes the magnetic field that the group experiences, and these protons shift. And the degree of shifting depends on the proximity as well as the angle to the shift reagent. So protons that are far away don't shift very much. Protons that are nearer shift a lot. Now, chiral shift reagents have a chiral ACAC group. So I'll say have chiral ACAC style ligands. So for example, one of these is based on camphor. We've seen a lot of camphor in the course. So one of these is based on a Claisen condensation product. Actually, a couple of them are based on Claisen condensation products of camphor. And over here, we can have a CF3 or a CF3, CF2, CF3 group. In other words, a trifluoromethyl group 
or a uh, hexa or a heptafluoropropyl group. And again, I'll maybe draw this in the ACAC style and the ligand style and show that we have three of these coordinated to europium. And so this is called either EU TFC three in the case of the trifluoromethyl group or EU HFC three in the case of the hexafluoropropyl group. And what we have now is a shift reagent that is chiral. And that means it's going to interact with two different enantiomers differently. And I want to show you this with some spectra. All right. And I think this is on, yeah, this is on handout three. So I'm going to bounce to handout three at this point. All right, so handout three comes from a book that I also like and also recommend. We tried it as a textbook one year, basic one and two dimensional NMR spectroscopy, another book out of Germany, I might add. And so they start here by introducing uh, shift reagents. And back in the days where, shift, where NMR spectrometers were way weaker, so they give an example from a 90 megahertz NMR spectrum. Even a molecule as simple as hexanol had a spectrum that really looked like hell. And so in this particular experiment, they demonstrate that when you add a small amount of the europium DPM3, the hexanol coordinates to it as I had drawn on the blackboard. And now your methyl group doesn't shift very much. The methylene group that's next to the oxygen, that's what's uh, you know, right near the europium, shifts a lot. And the in-between methyl methylene groups that had been all lumped together, shift and become disperse. And that was useful for things like if you have a steroid like cholesterol, which would just be a mess at 90 and isn't even very pretty at 500 or 600 megahertz, that would be useful for that. Now, if that was all to the technique, I think it would have, you know, would have been relegated to the dustbin of history, but Here's an example of a chiral shift reagent. And they start out in this example, so further along in the handout, they start with a single enantiomer of phenylethylamine. And I think in this, uh, this example, they use the S enantiomer. And so what they show happens here is as you add increasing aliquots, increasing amounts of your shift reagent, your key proton shift. For example, this proton, the one that's next to the NH2 group is a quartet. And so it starts at about four parts per million. As you add more and more, it shifts downfield, that quartet shifts downfield. It also begins to broaden out because the paramagnetism makes it broaden. Now, what they do in the next example on the next page is they show, here's what happens if you have the racemate. So this is the same spectrum. They've added their chiral shift reagent. And now this is the racemate where you have the NH2. And this enantiomer. And the two enantiomers interact differentially with the chiral shift reagent. 
As a result, your quartets, now you see one for each enantiomer. And if you have an enantio-enriched rather than racemic mixture, now you can see the two different quartets are two different sizes. And so you can measure the areas and measure the enantiomeric ratio. And that's nice, a simple experiment that allows you to determine the enantiomeric purity of your compound with just an NMR sample. So that's a nice, nice example. Well, we're at 951, and I think this is a good time to take any final questions, and maybe next time I'll pick up uh, with chiral derivatizing agents and then move on to some other techniques that I'd like to talk about. So any final questions for today's lecture? Yeah, so with this last technique, um, do you need to have a uh, Lewis base on your molecule? And can you only tell um, the different shifts for the protons near that Lewis base? That is exactly correct, Brian. So you need to have a Lewis base in your molecule and you can only tell the different shifts. Typically it would be near to the Lewis base. Often the Lewis base is right at the stereocenter as it was in phenethylamine. I'm gonna add one other comment to my, uh, to my notes here. And that is your solvent cannot be a Lewis base because it's going to compete. So in other words, well, this was done in a day, well, the first example that I showed was done in te carbon tetrachloride on a low field NMR spectrometer, but deuterochloroform, deuteromethylene chloride, deuterobenzene, deuterotoluene, these are all okay, but on the other hand, solvents like CD3OD, uh, DMSO, D6, CD3, CN, these are all gonna compete, so these are not okay. So yeah, so you need a Lewis base and you need a non-coordinating solvent that's not going to compete. Um, so it can be a very useful technique in certain circumstances. And it's nice because you could have an ether in your molecule, you could have an alcohol in your molecule, you could have an amine in your molecule, you could have an amide, you could probably have an ester or a ketone as well. Other questions? All right, we will pick up on Friday. As I said, we'll start with chiral derivatizing agents. I will look forward to seeing you then. Bye now. Have a great day. Can I ask you a really quick question? Yeah. So I'm a little confused. Um, so you said that, okay, you need an open coordination site. So I'm assuming that you need the metal there with the three ligands that you were mentioning. Um, so do you basically, when you prep your sample, do you put your compound in there in the presence of the metal and then take the NMR sample to see how it makes the Lewis base shift? What I would usually do would be dissolve my sample, say in deuterochloroform in the NMR2, and then I might have a stock solution of the shift reagent in deuterochloroform, and I would add small aliquots of it because you don't want too much or it'll basically broaden your spectrum out. So that first example I showed with the phenylethylamine where they added increasing amounts and you walk the protons,
that was a good example because what they showed is you're basically just titrating it in so that you get a good degree of shifting. You get a few ppm of shifting, but you don't completely blow out the spectrum. So I would have my pure compound in deuterochloroform. I'd take an NMR spectrum. I'd add a small aliquot of my europium, my EUHFC3 or EUTFC3 and take a spectrum. I'd add a little bit more if needed, take a spectrum. Add a little more if needed, take a spectrum. And ideally I'd do this first with maybe the racemate so I could get a feeling of where the resonances evolve, where they you know, separate. And then I would do it with my enantio-enriched compounds. So you could imagine a synthetic methods project where you're exploring, say, chiral ligands to try to set a stereocenter. And you're trying, first you develop the reaction to make the racemate, or maybe you have an authentic sample of the racemate. And then you're, say, trying different ligands, maybe a reaction a day with a different ligand to see which chiral ligand makes your stereocenter the most enantiopure, forms your stereocenter the most enantiopure. So your workflow might be you run a reaction with a new ligand, you isolate your product, you take an NMR spectrum, you take it, you start to add a chiral shift reagent and you determine the enantiomeric ratio. Okay, that makes sense. And then you just sort of compare what your enantiomeric pure compound is relative to the racemic mixture. Yeah, or... Yeah, you're an antio-enriched compound. And often in a synthetic methods project, your goal is to get up to very high in antiomeric ratios. Now, the downside is because the spectra get a little bit broader, it usually isn't great when you're trying to, and, and multiplets are hard to see. So it's usually not great. You know, many techniques these days want to get up to 99% EE or 97% EE. A chiral shift reagent may not be good at detecting 3% of an enantiomer. It may be better at detecting like an 80-20 mixture than a 99 to 1 mixture or 99.5 to 0.5. So next lecture, I'll talk about some techniques that can be useful. Of course, another technique that people often use is chiral HPLC, a separation technique, and that's a great technique as well. And then your workflow is basically, you run a reaction, you isolate your product, you inject it in the chiral HPLC, and you know where your two enantiomers come out. And that's a great technique as well. Tomorrow I'll discuss, or Friday I'll discuss chiral derivatizing agents that also can work very well in this context. Professor Rignovsky also is a nice technique that's involved in, well, it's more for determining absolute configuration than determining an antimeric purity, so not as relevant to what we're talking about. Anyway, that's, that's part of the range of techniques you have, you know, not just separation techniques, but also NMR techniques.